most fascinating aspects of the human experience with us as humans. And as a student of communication, I have come to realize that uh, we use language since uh, our uh, very early years as children to name and categorize the world. But we also use language to tell stories about ourselves, and we use also language to tell stories about other people. And when we tell those stories about other people, um, we often participate in a process of constructing a, a social reality, a form of knowledge that uh, we come to use in order to help us understand ourselves, our positions in the worlds we find ourselves in. And these uh, reservoirs or bodies of knowledge come to help us understand our relationship with the other. The other being other species that we share this planet with, or other peoples and other cultures. And today I want to talk about how the story of Islam and Muslims have come to be constructed visually um, in the Western imagination. And in order to do that, I will first uh, talk about, very briefly, a history of, or give a historical context of Islamophobia, of where these discourses and, and images of Islam and Muslims as a violent other come from. So I'll try to give very brief uh, descriptions of some of the events that I think are milestones in our histories, our shared histories, and how these contribute to uh, these images of Islam or these stories about Muslims. And then I will secondly talk about the role that media representations, Western media representations, especially in the US, in television, film, and other forms of popular culture, kind of contribute to this rhetoric of fear-mongering that uh, target Islam and Muslims in general. So, and I want to start here long before the rise of Islam, uh, the Greeks, and especially one Greek philosopher by the name of Herodotus. Um, Herodotus was, the, was named the father of history. He is the author of the very first book that is considered the very first manuscript that has investigated history as a subject or as a discipline. So in his book, Herodotus, long before the coming of Islam, uh, writes about the Persian Wars, the war be between Greeks, between the Greeks and the Persians. And in that, in, in his account, which is not necessarily a historical, factual account, we find references to uh, the Persians as barbarians, as despots, as authoritarian. And mind you, this is before, much, much before the coming of Islam. There, uh, while the Greeks or the Greeks are thought of as rational, democracy-loving philosophers, and that moment of the war between the Persian Eastern other and the Greek Western democratic, uh, kind of good person, that moment was or is talked about as essential, as a watershed in Western civilization, and a moment through which the West will be born as democratic, enlightened, and all of that, while the East, or the Persians, and later the, the Muslims will become this kind of other. Fast forward a few centuries um, onward, you have the seventh century and another historical mile and the, uh, milestone and the rise of Islam. And Islam, again, comes to be seen here as it rises and spreads to many parts of the world. It comes to be seen as a rival to Europe, to Christian Europe, and as a rival in two, kind of, in two folds. First, it's a theological rival in the sense that uh, Islam posed a kind, a kind of challenge to the monopoly of Christianity on monotheism because to, so much so that a lot of, a lot of Christians at the time uh, thought Muhammad was just a uh, a bad student of Christianity, or someone who had took Christianity and embellished it and rid it of all its controversies and produced this other religion, so there was never any acceptance. So there is that sense of uh, Islam as a theological uh, threat, and then there is Islam as a kind of geographical or a geopolitical threat in the sense that its vast spread to distant parts of the world 
from Morocco to Mongolia in the east, uh, into southern France in the north, and sub-Saharan Africa in the south, that was seen as a direct threat or challenge to Europe at the time, back then. And I'm referring to these uh, milestones as moments in our shared history that will somehow influence or give rise, I think, to the present, to where we are today. Uh, so as uh, a result, I think, to this rise of Islam, fast rise, you have another moment which is very important, the moment of the Crusades, which uh, is basically a, was a holy war against the Muslim infidels. And here again, you have these stories being uh, disseminated about Muslims or Muslims, as they used to be called, uh, that the Muslim is the real enemy of Europe uh, and the real enemy of Christianity. Um, as this story is deep in the distrust between uh, a Muslim East and a Christian Europe, uh, you also have the moment of the rise of the, uh, the Ottoman Empire and it being seen as a direct threat again to Europe. And you have again, once again, these stories being, gen being generated about how, how threatening, violent perhaps the East is. And here I have a quote for, from, from Edward Said's book, not for nothing did Islam come to symbolize terror, devastation, the demonic words of hated barbarians. For Europe, Islam was a lasting trauma. Until the end of the seventh century, the Ottoman peril lurked alongside Europe to represent the whole of Christian civilization, a constant danger. And yet, again, these images or stories are ways of imagining the East uh, being developed or being cooked historically. Together, these will lead to uh, a way of seeing the East. Uh, in the 19th century, you have this, uh, the development of this way of imagining or seeing the Orient or the Muslim East, uh, which Edward Said called uh, Orientalism. And Orientalism is basically this way of seeing that constructs the East, the Muslim world, uh, the Arabs, the Persians, as backward and civilized and dangerous. And, and this kind of uh, system of producing these images is articulated in various media, which brings me to my talk, the media origins of this. So we're moving from history, from stories that have been told perhaps verbally, that ways of imagining the East into the media. And the first medium I wanna talk about are paintings. And I want to start with this first painting by, by De La Croix in 1824. And this painting here, what we see is um, a reproduction of a moment. Uh, it's called the Massacre of Chios. And Chios was a Greek city. Uh, and it was being invaded, I think, in, my, in 1822 by the Turks. And again, in the painting, the, by the time De La Croix painted the painting, he had not been to that place, he had not witnessed the massacre, which makes it interesting in telling us about how this artist probably reflects a general way of imagining the East, imagining the Turks at the time. So what, what I want you to uh, perhaps focus on uh, are basically the images of these, uh, these Greeks who, who are waiting uh, in agony and pain. They are going to be perhaps made into slaves or killed. And there are clear uh, expressions in these faces of the terror that the Turks or the Easterners bring. And uh, what you have also is the bottom uh, right picture is this indifferent aggressor, the Turk, a dark man in his turban, completely closed eyes and turning his face away, uh, refusing to acknowledge, I think, his, his atrocities. And you have other works that also contribute, or other media that contribute to this, uh, to this idea of the East as violent and corrupt. And here you have another painting of De La Croix, of King Sardanapalus. And this king is allegedly, he was uh, defeated and knew that he was going, that the, the armies were going, were, were coming to capture him. And he decided that instead of meeting them in the battle, like perhaps Romans do, he decided that he will just burn and destroy all of his uh, belongings, 
his women, uh, his horses, his slaves, and everything because he knows that he's going to be defeated. And he's just going to sit there and watch that destruction. He's described historically, or, in, or the legend at least describes him as a violent, corrupt, uh, immoral, decadent king uh, of, from the East, from what would be today uh, modern, modern Iraq. And I've got a continuation of these media uh, from the 19th and the uh, from the 19th and 20th century descriptions of the East as irrational, dangerous. And you have here a painting of a city in my home country in Morocco, uh, where Delacroix travels and he meets these irrational, fanatic uh, Muslims who are uh, performing a ritual, a spiritual ritual, and uh, reportedly he had to hide because he knew if he was discovered, he would have been killed. And I'm paraphrasing from, uh, from the Daily Mail. Uh, that's their description of the historical context that led to the painting of this. And there are other pictures, of course, in the Orientalist trophy of the, the Arab uh, Muslim East as mysterious as uh, a country or a, a land of snake charmers and you have the motif or the, the trope of the heron, the oppression, slavery, in other paintings, I mean, just one because I don't have much time. So how does that relate to Hollywood? And, and here I want to make a connection by uh, saying that the US or Hollywood in the US, they inherit these ways of imagining the East, the Muslim, the Arab, the Persian, from the Europeans, from these paintings. And in Hollywood in the 20th century, we come to see these very Orientalist meanings permeate news coverage, television series, films, and comic books, and all other forms of representation of the Muslim uh, East in general, Muslim, Arab, altogether. Uh, in his book, uh, Real Bad Arabs, Jack Shaheen, for example, he analyzed more than a thousand Hollywood films between 1896 and 2001. And what he found in those films, he found that more than 800 of these films portrayed Arabs as subhumans consistently and systematically. <coughs> some of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, some of the, the tropes or meanings or representations uh, he, he found, Jack Shaheen highlights, were the image of the submissive, sensuous, Eastern woman who is oppressed, yet who is very interesting uh, sexually, overly sexualized. Uh, you have representations of the lecherous, buffoon, stupid Arab sheikh uh, reproduced in movies and again in, in other forms, even like <coughs> plays and so on, and cartoons before, uh, before television. And another uh, Another trope is that of the terrorist, the, the Eastern Muslim Arab terrorist who is a fanatic, who is a savage, who is lurking in the dark, just ready to come and kill us. And I think my favorite uh, representation of this, and I was going to play a video clip, is the idea of the Arab land and how the Arab land comes to be represented uh, in, in these media in Hollywood. And this quote comes uh, from the opening song of Disney film Aladdin, and it, where it basically sings, and I wish I could show the video, uh, that it sings that I come from a land, from a far away place where the caravan comes roam, where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Uh, so this adds all together to these tropes and meanings of representation. But his study was up to 2001, which was before uh, the Arab, uh, not the Arab Spring, before 9-11. Uh, but we see again, even in the post 9-11 representations, these, uh, these images, these representations, they consist, they keep on. You have, for example, the film 300, uh, the story of which comes from that book I started with, with the book about history. And it tells the legend of these 300 Spartans who actually uh, made, made it very difficult for 
thousands of Persian soldiers. And you have, I think, what is striking is the face of the enemy there, right, the Persian enemy. So, but while these representations of vilifying the Arab, the Eastern, the Muslim persist, some very interesting developments uh, emerge in the post-9-11 era. Uh, and, I and I think that's what uh, one of the researchers in this area has described as the rise of positive portrayals. But these positive portrayals are usually one of two. So you have the portrayal of uh, the Arab, Eastern, Muslim, whatever you want to call it, as a victim of abuse or hate crime or harassment in the post-9-11 era as a result of the spread of uh, racial profiling or Islamophobia and so on. And this, you have the picture there, the example from rendition. And another positive portrayal is that of the patriot American who is uh, helping his country in, uh, in the war against terror in order to help win the country. So the positive, I think, the good Muslim, you, so you have two portrayals. You, you can either be the victim and then you get our sympathy and we'll cry with you, uh, or you need to help us uh, in, the, in winning the war on terror. Uh, so what is problematic with that? Well, Evelyn Oseltani argues that the problem with that, with that kind of portrayal, that positive quote-unquote portrayal, is that it evaluates the Arab Muslim always in the context of terrorism. The Arab Muslim is always evaluated in relation to terrorism, and in doing so, it reaffirms the relationship between the Muslim the, or the Arab and terrorism. And I have an example quote from this year earlier uh, by Bill Clinton who said, and I have abridged the quote because of space, he basically said, if you are a Muslim and you love freedom and democracy and so on, if you are a Muslim and you hate terror, stay here and help us win and make a future together. And I think one way I thought of that was perhaps if he had said, if he had talked about Latinos and said, if you are a Latino and you don't like drugs or you don't traffic in drugs, stay here, we want you. Or if you, I don't know, if you're black and you don't fight crime, stay here, we want you to help us fight crime. Um, so that's kind of the, the context or the, what I think of as the media uh, environment we live in and how it contributes this stereotypical image of the East and how it, I think, it contributes to the environment of Islamophobia and fear-mongering that uh, Muslims are the target of. And I want to uh, leave on a question perhaps that we can come back to, is the question of, well, where does this leave us? Uh, can the media be part of a solution? Uh, I don't know, I want to hear from you and I'll be happy to uh, engage in discussions and answer any questions at the end. Thank you.